The Camel Tribe and the Chevrotains by W. P. Pycraft, ALS, FZS. The camels and llamas, constituting the present group, form a very distinct section of the great assemblage of animals known as the ruminants, or cud chewers. The camel tribe are peculiar amongst the ruminants in that they never possess horns, and in that the stomach is only divided into three instead of four compartments. This division into compartments being intimately connected with the ruminating habit. Furthermore, the upper jaw bears cutting teeth, or front teeth, as they are popularly called. Though the full set, three pairs, is only complete in the young. In the adult, but one pair remains, the others being shed. The canine, or eye teeth, are also peculiar in their position, those of the lower jaw being separated from the cutting teeth by a very considerable gap. In the structure of the feet, the camel tribe are no less peculiar. Indeed, it is on this character that the scientific name of the group is founded. Only two toes are present. These are of equal size, and instead of being protected by hoofs, are provided with a hardened skin, covering a cushion-like pad, which expands when the weight of the body is thrown upon the foot, as in walking. This is an admirable adaptation for walking on soft and yielding sands. Hoofs are represented only by a pair of broad nails. The three-chambered stomach is remarkable because the chamber known as the paunch lodges in its walls a large collection of water cells, in which can be stored as much as a gallon and a half of water. This faculty of storing water is invaluable to an animal which has often to subsist for days on absolutely waterless deserts. Note the slit-like nostrils in the illustration of the Bactrian camel on page 306. These can be closed at the will of the animal, a useful precaution against the entrance of sand during the violent sandstorms which often arise in the desert. The true camels are distinguished by the possession of a hump or humps. There are never more than two. It is in these humps that the camel was popularly supposed to store water. In reality, they are huge masses of fat, serving as a reserve store of food. The accumulation of fat for this purpose is a common feature amongst the mammalia. Most animals which hibernate, or lay up and sleep during the winter, store up fat. But except in the camel, it is distributed more or less evenly over the body. With hard work or bad feeding, the camel's hump dwindles almost to nothing. When on the eve of a long journey, the Arab looks anxiously to the state of this hump. For on the size of this depends the animal's condition and ability to undertake the march. The Arabian camel as a wild animal has long since been extinct. Of the hordes of so-called wild camels which abound in the desert regions of Central Asia, Gobi Steppe, some are probably descendants of domesticated animals which have escaped from captivity, but others may be aboriginally wild. From the evidence of fossil camels, there seems little doubt that this animal originated in North America. One branch of the family, the llamas, migrating into South America, and the other, the camels, crossing Bering Sea into the Old World. The True Camel before proceeding further, it may be well to refer to the confusion which exists in the use of the names camel and dromedary. The latter name seems popularly to be applied to the two humped species, the name camel being reserved for the one with a single hump. This is a mistake. The dromedary is a swift breed of riding camel of the one humped species and is so called to distinguish it from its slower brother, the pack camel, or baggage camel. The pack camel, it is interesting to note, has been introduced into Australia, where it has proved invaluable in crossing the vast, waterless deserts, on account of its power to exist for long periods without drinking. 
The true, or Arabian camel, is found in a domesticated state in Africa and Asia, and, as we have just indicated, belongs to the one-humped species. It is a long-limbed, short-haired animal, standing as much as seven feet high. As a wild animal, it is extinct. Much mystery, indeed, surrounds the question of its origin. It has been suggested that the Arabian camel, or its immediate parent, may have sprung from an Indian ancestor, and thence made its way through Arabia and Syria into northern Africa. Not only is the camel indispensable as a beast of burden, but it is esteemed also for its hair, its flesh, bones, and milk. The hair is woven into cloth. In some parts of India, the bones are used instead of ivory for inlaid work. The milk is unusually thick and rich, so much so that it cannot be used for tea or coffee, as it curdles when mixed with either. The camel is popularly supposed to be a very docile animal, but those who speak from experience declare it to be stupid, surly, and vicious to the last degree. It is, however, not entirely void of understanding, and apparently cherishes feelings of revenge, as the following story shows. A camel, working in an oil mill, was severely beaten by its driver. Perceiving that the camel had treasured up the injury, and was only waiting a favorable opportunity for revenge, he kept a strict watch upon the animal. Time passed away. The camel, perceiving it was watched, was quiet and obedient, and the driver began to think the beating was forgotten, when one night, after the lapse of several months, the man was sleeping on a raised platform in the mill, whilst the camel, as is customary, was stabled in a corner. Happening to awake, the driver observed by the bright moonlight that, when all was quiet, the animal looked cautiously round, rose softly, and stealing towards a spot where a bundle of clothes and a burnus thrown carelessly on the ground resembled a sleeping figure, cast itself with violence upon them, rolling with all its weight and tearing them most viciously with its teeth. Satisfied that revenge was complete, the camel was returning to its corner when the driver sat up and spoke. At the sound of his voice, perceiving the mistake it had made, the animal was so mortified at the failure and discovery of its scheme that it dashed its head against the wall and died on the spot. It is said that when camels pass a mounted man in a narrow path, they will turn their heads suddenly round and endeavor to inflict a bite on the rider's arm or shoulder. This is naturally much dreaded, as a camel's bite is particularly severe. Much care has been spent in the breeding of the camel. In the Sahara Desert, says Canon Tristram, the Turareg is as careful in the selection of his breeding Mahari, a fine race of the dromedary, as the Arab is in that of his horse. The pedigrees are handed down and many a dromedary can boast a genealogy far longer than the descendants of the Darley Arabian, page 202. The Bactrian Camel This species is often called the dromedary, but, as we have already remarked, this is an error. The dromedary is a swift breed of the Arabian camel, the Bactrian camel may be distinguished from its Arabian relative by the fact that it has two humps, is shorter in the leg and heavier, and has longer hair and stouter and harder feet. The shorter legs are distinctly advantageous, enabling the animal to get about with ease and safety over rocky and hilly ground. The hordes of wild camels found in Turkestan, in the neighborhood of Kashgar, are believed by Major C.S. Cumberland to be descended from camels which escaped when the district known as Takla Makan was buried in a great sandstorm 200 years ago. From the fury of that storm, it is said, no human being escaped alive. Some camels apparently did, perhaps owing their survival to the power they possess of closing the nostrils and thereby keeping out the sand. The Bactrian camel lives upon the salt and bitter plants of the steppes, which are rejected by almost all other animals. 
it is further able to drink brackish water from the salt lakes by which it is surrounded. When pressed by hunger, it will even eat felt blankets, bones, and skins of other animals, and fish. The Llamas The Llamas are humpless camels, and confined to the western and southernmost parts of South America. Two wild and two domesticated species are known. The name llama, it should be mentioned, properly belongs to the domesticated animal of that name. The vicuña. This is the smaller of the two wild species. Vicuñas live in herds in the mountain ranges of Peru, dwelling during the wet season high up amid rocks and precipices, near the region of perpetual snow. In the dry season, they descend to the higher valleys. Their capture is a matter of great difficulty, for apart from the inaccessible nature of their haunts, they are exceedingly shy and vigilant. They are clothed in a woolly coat of extremely delicate texture, much in demand for weaving purposes. The baby vicuña, it is interesting to note, is able to run swiftly directly after its birth, and possesses great powers of endurance. This is the more noteworthy, since the young of the camel are exceedingly helpless. Vicuñas are hunted by the Indians, and captured by driving them into an enclosure of perhaps half a mile in diameter. This is hung round with bits of colored rag, which, fluttering in the wind, appear to deter the captives from breaking through. The Guanaco This is larger than the Vicuña, and is described as an elegant animal, being possessed of a long, slender, gracefully curved neck and fine legs. It ranges from the highlands of the Andes to the plains of Patagonia and the islands of Tierra del Fuego. As Mr. Darwin points out, the behavior of Guanaco when alarmed is very contradictory. At one time they will sound the danger signal and put themselves out of harm's way long before the enemy has perceived them. At another they exhibit the most extraordinary curiosity and pay the death penalty in consequence. That they are curious is certain, for if a person lies on the ground and plays strange antics, such as throwing up his feet in the air, they will almost always approach by degrees to reconnoiter him. It was an artifice that was repeatedly practiced by our sportsmen with success, and it had, moreover, the advantage of allowing several shots to be fired, which were all taken as part of the performance. On the mountains of Tierra del Fuego, I have more than once seen a guanaco, on being approached, not only neigh and squeal, but prance and leap about in the most ridiculous manner, apparently in defiance, as a challenge. These animals are very easily domesticated, and I have seen some thus kept in northern Patagonia near a house, though not under any restraint. They are in this state very bold, and readily attack a man by striking him from behind with both knees. The wild guanacos, however, have no idea of defense. Even a single dog will secure one of these large animals till the huntsman can come up. In many of their habits, they are like sheep in a flock. Thus, when they see men approaching in several directions on horseback, they soon become bewildered and know not which way to run. This greatly facilitates the Indian method of hunting, for they are thus easily driven to a central point and are encompassed. Guanacos readily take to the water, and have been frequently seen swimming from one island to another. Here again the llamas differ from the camels, for these can swim but little, if at all. Like the Bactrian camel, the guanaco can drink salt water with impunity. One of the most remarkable traits of the guanaco is that which induces it, when it feels its end to be near, to seek out the dying place of the tribe, and there breathe out its last. The guanacos, says Mr. Darwin, appear to have favorite spots for lying down to die. On the banks of the St. Cruz, in certain circumscribed places, which were generally bushy and all near the river, the ground was actually white with bones. 
On one such spot, I counted between ten and twenty heads. The animals in most cases must have crawled before dying beneath and amongst the bushes. The Llama This is the first of the two domesticated offshoots of the guanaco, the other being the alpaca. The llama is a larger beast than the guanaco and variable in color. The ancient Peruvians bred it as a beast of burden or for riding, and before the Spanish conquest kept it in enormous numbers. Soon after the Spanish conquest, it was not uncommon to meet droves of from three to five hundred or even one thousand llamas, each laden with silver ingots, and the whole in charge of a single native. Only the male llamas were used as beasts of burden, while the smaller females were kept for their milk and flesh. In traveling along the roads, the droves marched in single file under the guidance of a leader, and such a line would traverse the highest passes of the Cordillera and skirt the most stupendous precipices with perfect safety. The Spanish conquerors of Peru spoke of llama flesh as being fully equal to the best mutton, and they established shops in the towns for its regular sale. At the time of the conquest, it is estimated that upwards of 300,000 llamas were employed in the transport of the product of the mines of Potosi alone. The Alpaca This animal is bred solely for the sake of its wool, which is of great length and fineness. From it is made the well-known fabric which bears, in consequence, the name alpaca. The alpaca is kept in herds on the high grounds of Bolivia and South Peru, whence it is annually driven down to be sheared. The Incas dyed the wool, which is of two qualities, a fine and a coarse, with bright colors, and made it up into cloth or blankets as the occasion served. The earliest account of this animal is by Augustin de Zarate, the treasurer general of Peru in 1544. He speaks of the beast as a sheep, but since he describes it as camel-like in shape, though devoid of a hump, there can be no doubt that it is the llama he is describing. He says, In places where there is no snow, the natives want water, and to supply this they fill the skins of sheep with water and make other living sheep carry them. For, it must be remarked, these sheep of Peru are large enough to serve as beasts of burden. They can carry about 100 pounds or more, and the Spaniards used to ride them, and they would go four or five leagues a day. When they are weary, they lie down on the ground, and as there are no means of making them get up, either by beating or assisting them, the load must of necessity be taken off. When there is a man on one of them, if the beast be tired and urged to go on, he turns his head round and discharges his saliva, which has an unpleasant odor, into the rider's face. These animals are of great use and profit to their masters, for their wool is very good and fine. And the expense of their food is trifling, as a handful of maize suffices them, and they can go four or five days without water. Their flesh is as good as that of the fat sheep of Castile. There are now public shambles for the sale of their flesh in all parts of Peru, which was not the case when the Spaniards came first. The particularly offensive habit of spitting in the face of people who may be obnoxious to it is well known to those who are in the habit of seeing much of this animal. The Chevrotains Mention must be made, before passing to the pig tribe, of the smallest of hoofed mammals, the royal antelope accepted, the Chevrotains. These little animals are hornless and intermediate in character between the deer, camels, and pigs. The males have large canine teeth, like those of the musk deer, with which the Chevrotains have long been confounded. The range of these animals, of which there are five species known, extends from India and Ceylon, through the Malayan countries, 
as far east as the island of Palawan in the Philippine group. One species, the largest of the group, occurs on the west coast of Africa. End of section 55. Recording by Stephen Winterburn.